we are live thank you pekka for joining the distributed fabric pod i have heard a lot about terso and i have been follower of your blog as well um i have a lot of questions ab- uh, from you uh, to you from mm-hmm. from various parts of distributed systems and database internals and yeah i am so excited to have you here yeah thanks for having me really great to be on 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 your all right show so the first question which i have for you is please uh introduce yourself to yeah. the audience <laughs> so that they know why i am so excited to talk to you yeah so uh, absolutely so i'm pek i'm the ceo and founder of turso we essentially try to bring sqlite everywhere um you know i'm sure we will talk about in more detail uh what we do and specifically what we've been doing uh is to bring sqlite into this what i call the serverless edge uh we founded the company with uh, a global cost up to years ago roughly and before that we actually go way back we we worked on at a company called Silla DB which is a Apache Cassandra compatible NoSQL uh data store and actually I know global from even before that so we did Linux kernel uh you know we we'll work on similar areas in the Linux kernel so I was the maintainer of Linux uh dynamic memory allocators and before that i was actually or i have been doing real work doing backend with java when java was a cool technology so that's uh, the short introduction that's quite cool so i will start from the basics so mm-hmm. you have been doing a phd mm-hmm. uh, along with founding a company the so <laughs> last when i yeah so the last time when i heard i think both the things are equally tough so why did you decide to fight the battles on both ends yeah so you know it's just a, I, i think it's a lucky or unlucky accident so uh actually decided to do a phd uh in i think 2016 uh it's a local university so it 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 was it was great i just wanted to basically get more into the so sort of, i don't i don't know if you know the feeling of reading research papers and not really understanding <laughs> you know what they're about like this for me that was the situation so i really wanted to sort of unlock that part as well uh, and i had no plans to 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 found a company so it's all globers actually fault uh, he asked asked me to 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 do this thing and and, and actually initially said no but uh, yeah so but don't ask my phd supervisor if it's smart to to do both of these things but i do like that the research topic that i have is essentially low latency network systems so there is of course a lot of uh, overlap but if you go and look at the publications i have most of them are in 2019 and turso was founded in, in 2021 so it mm-hmm. probably gives you some idea but yeah so like for for me it is all, all about uh, being able to combine the academic side and and also engineer right so i'm an engineer by trade uh so but i i i do like most of the stuff i do is is around systems research and i i, I do think there's a actually nice overlap it's just you know lack of time uh that that hurts the most so i mean i think you're the right person for me to ask this and i really want to understand this so i have a problem that i cannot think above code and i had seen a talk uh, with um, talk by lesley lamport as well where he talks about thinking above code so i want to understand your perspectives as uh, an engineer mm-hmm. how you approach a software so for example me when you talk to me in terms of a feature or anything i have to develop for me it's like okay in this repo here this file in this line if i do some changes something will happen so i'm not mm-hmm. able to think in systems so how mm-hmm. does so how so what kind of i'm assuming that phd gives you that sort of training as well that you start thinking in abstractions so be still being a low level engineer systems programmer mm-hmm. how do you think these things come into the picture and how how does one make uh, themselves efficient in these things yeah so i think that's exactly uh, right so so like for me one of the main benefits of of starting to do the phd was really to force myself to think in terms of abstractions and i actually still suck at it i think like for for me it's like <laughs> like i i uh, i i i do tend to think about systems uh, at kind of like a kind of low level like i it's hard to describe but like i usually sort of 
at least I feel that I see the how the code paths execute, right? And 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 like one of the things I spent quite a lot of time uh, was uh, digging into the POSIX uh, model, right? So so and actually it was actually uh, something that we were planning to publish. We didn't manage, so it's uh, in in academia. So it's now a uh, Usenix logging article, which talks about like the POSIX abstractions and interfaces and spent a lot of time sort of digging through the history of how operating system abstractions came to be and, and so forth. And it was a super great exercise in, like if you think about something like a, a MMAP uh, system mm -hmm. call. So it, it's basically allows you to, hey, network yeah. failure. No problem. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. Now I switched yeah, to my it's, mobile. It's fine actually. It is uh, something which is very important because um, in today's world, we often say that, you know, network partitions have are becoming rare. <laughs> you fabric absolutely. podcast. They, this they are so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, so, so I, I don't know how we, we uh, it sort of uh, cut this, but, but basically, yeah. So uh, POSIX really, or digging into that really taught me about thinking in terms of abstractions and the MMAP system call, for example, it's fascinating to go and read the kind of ideas people had. It's like, it's going to be inter-process communication and all of these things. And, uh, but yeah, I don't know if I have any good advice. Like I, I do totally suck at thinking in terms of abstractions, but sometimes, uh, sometimes it's just helpful to think of in terms of like, like big ideas. And, you know, if you go and, uh, you know, teach yourself the distributed consensus or like any of those kinds of algorithms, you're sort of like forced to, um, to first figure out the, the big things and, and, and then get into the, the small things. But like for me, uh, you know, I tend to think that if I haven't implemented something like an algorithm or a piece of system, mm -hmm. I, I usually don't understand it on, until I do. Which explains why I have so many. Well, we, I used to have a lot of repositories on GitHub. So I just, like a lot of times I just ended up, like I take a paper, right? And then I try to essentially reproduce the, the, the paper, like to, to some extent. Hmm. Interesting. So uh, you mentioned this article about POSIX hmm. and I actually read that article for uh, this podcast and I want to dig a little deeper there and I ask one question mm -hmm. that um, help me understand when you say POSIX has been CPU centric mm -hmm. and the newer hardwares are not able to uh, take leverage of that. So, I mean, mm -hmm. I don't understand this. What, what are you trying to say here? Yeah, which which direction should we start from? So the CPU, maybe we start from the CPU centricism, right? Yeah. So if you trace back uh, the origins of POSIX, and it is essentially just Unix uh, created in the seventy early seventies, uh, mm. and if you and and then POSIX is just the standardization, and like you have Unix first created in the early or sixty nine, and then you know, this different, then you have the Berkeley Unix and, and all of a sudden you have the commercial Unix in the eighties. And, you know, I didn't live through that time. So this is just a purely a historical uh, reference and then Linux in the early nineties and, 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 and so forth. So, but if you, if you, if you sort of peel through the layers of POSIX, like what, what do you have at the very beginning, right? So you don't have networking, right? You don't even have virtual memory. Like if you if you look at the like very first versions of documented Unix, they are really essentially just a, a way to abstract the, the PDP eleven which they were built on, right? So the like a a, a commodity CPU at the time, I I suppose. Mm -hmm. Again, I didn't live through that time, so I don't I don't know I don't know uh, how many people would have access to it, but like actually. Unix was created on PDP 10, I think, and that was like literally some, you know, microcomputer lying somewhere. So that's what I I sort of mean by the CPU centricism that the, the initial abstractions that you have, you have a concept called process, uh, which is a it's an it's an instance of 
an executable that is running on a CPU, right. but it's also a container for stuff like files um, and file system, by the way, so that the history of Unix is really the, I think Ken Thompson and others were working on a file system for an earlier uh, operating system, but, but, but nonetheless, so as you progress through the 70s, uh, you get more powerful CPUs, so you get the VAX uh, architecture, which now has virtual memory. So now they start to introduce virtual memory into the thing. And then, you, you know, internet comes, you know, you have the TCP IP stack in you know, 83 or whatever, right? And that is already, from my perspective, the first sort of signal that, that the, the abstractions don't quite match because sockets, which is the way you do, you know, a network program with Unix, they're sort of kind of like files, but they're not actually files, <laughs> they're sockets. Uh, and then I think things, you know, take turn for worse in the late 80s, uh, you start to see multi-core uh, CPUs appear. So all of a sudden the process abstraction is no longer uh, enough. They introduced threads. Uh, I think uh, one of the original Unix designers were saying that the threads are a mistake. Um, you know, I don't know if, if that's the case, but nonetheless, so they start to add this stuff. But then interesting enough, well, like once you go to, let's say early 2000s, you start to get GPUs, right? So now you have up until, well, I, you know, I'm sure there were some specialized hardware even before that, but now you sort of have a mass market compute that is not like the CPU. That abstraction doesn't exist in, in Unix anymore at all, right? It is essentially like you, the way to program a CP, uh, sorry, a GPU is you open a device file which represents the GPU and then you upload some code to it, right? So that yeah. no longer matches. So the, the, the core uh, abstractions are really, from my perspective, built around this idea that you have a centralized CPU, then you have some you know, memory around or sort of uh, yeah, RAM. Yeah. They don't even consider caches because those didn't really exist and so forth, right? So this is the way to that, that Unix is really built. And now if you think about the kind of future we are at right now already, so you actually have compute in different places, uh, not just, just the GPUs, but if you look at the network inter interface cards and even storage devices, they will have their own CPUs, right? And you have mm -hmm. compute there. Uh, and also you have uh, like special purpose accelerators so that uh, uh, tensor processing units and all of that stuff yeah. around AI and so forth. So POSIX doesn't really have anything. Is it, it really isn't relevant in, in this, this scenario. So what is happening basically is that the, you know, you, you have these machines where Linux boots up, but it's essentially like a control plane, right? It's a, it's a way to orchestrate the actual programs to, to run. Like, of course, we have a lot of workloads that are still just using, uh, you know, CPU, but, but that's the, that's the thinking behind. Um, yeah, I get it. Interesting. I mean, quite interesting. Uh, I'd never had thought about that before. Uh, well, me neither, but like, so, but so like that, that was actually, so it was, uh, supposed to be, uh, and, uh, like a research article and then it just turned into a, uh, like a longer magazine article, but really mm -hmm. like the thing started from, uh, so, you know, we go back in time, like four years or something and these smart NICs or programmable NICs were just starting to appear. Right. Um, uh, and the, 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 the reason why these NICs now start to have a compute is because networks are getting so fast, right? They're going, go, mm. like if you have a hundred gig NIC, for example, you know, you can't, the, the Linux kernel networks that really can't keep up and, and so forth. That's why you have stuff like kernel bypass and, and so forth. So for me, it was like, really like, let's look into this. And then, uh, like I had a lot of questions. So, you know, I was a Linux kernel developer, but I like if somebody asked me why do we have the MUP system call? I had no idea. So I just wanted to like let's let's dig into this. Uh so it was that through that work that that you know I think this discovery of of uh, CPU uh centric design sort of uh... understood. 
uh, okay so now i want to go to one more question of uh, before getting into the work you do at terso so mm-hmm. i saw a talk of yours where you were discussing about a sky computing yes. terminology mm-hmm. so uh, i want to understand what what is that now because very it was very tough for me to understand what an edge computing is <laughs> now you <laughs> now what is sky computing yeah absolutely so uh, i don't think sky computing is uh, is a term that we use in the industry at least yet uh, you know the, the closest uh, sort of similar thing would be like multi cloud right but so uh cloud computing really uh, if you go i guess 20 years back in time uh to look at the like the really early academic work in cloud computing so the big idea was computing as utility so what does it mean it's like it it, 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 it really the dream was that that uh, doing compute like you you know you get electricity right you don't you don't really care or you shouldn't care how that compute happens like i have this application now i'm going to you know buy this not even capacity right that's also like this interesting intersections with serverless as well like the thinking was really like now we're going to make this compute like a commodity and applications can just run uh, in different places and and you have different providers and so forth so instead of this we actually got you know three four giants uh, that are their own ecosystems essentially right yeah. so yeah. you you do build your application for aws or google or azure and like there's not a lot of at least it's not yeah, easy to move your yeah so sky computing is um, I, i guess mostly coming from academia uh, there's people at berkeley uh, for example a research team doing that work so it's essentially rethinking the model of something above the clouds right and i don't know if this is going to happen right because the thing is that i don't know if cloud vendors actually have any incentive to to, to support this but nonetheless that's that's the model the the thinking that you know you're going to decouple your application or the way you do your applications uh from from the cloud providers and so forth and like i said if you go and look at multi cloud like there are industry solutions for this as well um you mm-hmm. know i think hashicorp is doing work in this area with uh i forgot the tool that the name of the tool that they're working on but that's really the the thinking interesting now i want to ask you that what do you do at terzo i know that you are a cto <laughs> but still uh, like so yeah so last week and this week i've been fixing our javascript um client api uh so i think like for a startup cto you know your job is just to build stuff essentially right mm-hmm. and then as you grow uh you know you 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 maybe start to start to do more stuff around uh, you know how how work gets done and so forth but basically you know we have a great team of 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 super talented folks um so my job essentially is somehow bridge the gap between like what what users want what we think users want where do we think the industry is heading and then the actual like you know let's let's get this thing done um so balancing basically between building stuff and then thinking about what stuff to build and and then of course talking to you know people customers partners and and so forth yeah and then you know spending your time in these type of podcasts as well yeah so, well uh, yeah well, I, so but this is like this is also of course like from uh city perspective it's great to be able to you know on the other hand you know be on this podcast and and tell about what you're doing but also for me these are usually super great ways to learn about like you know what is actually happening in the industry yeah. uh, you know what what people are interested in in so forth yeah so i wanted to ask you exactly that that as a, a cto as a thought leader what do you think you know what is happening in database why is the database industry so hot again i thought you know the problem is solved after postgres but then there is every so much database is coming out every year 
what is happening <laughs> yeah so so i i so if there's a, there are a couple of site act, sites that actually list lists the different number of of, of databases and uh, i think i lost count already but it's like in the like even active ones in in the hundreds right but the reality is that you have uh, you know you have a handful of really large uh, you know community so you have the mysql community postgres community sqlite community then of course you have in the nosql uh, side of things you have mongo uh, cassandra and, and and all of those things but basically like the reason why databases keep popping up is because like, from from my perspective is because applications and workloads keep changing right so if you look at the mm. sort of cycle of of you know database uh, uh products popping up what usually tends to happen is that and the, like the no sequel movement is a great example so you know somewhere in 2010 or whatever amazon you know tells everybody you know ditch all the tra transactions let they're too slow yeah. uh, and they were almost certainly right at the time as well right and and then, you know, people start to build for this. And the, the reason why they did that was because they had this massive scale. Nobody really was doing things at that level yet, right? But then, you know, time goes on, MySQL improves, Postgres improves, right? They start to incorporate these ideas. And then you have the, like the, all the distributed SQL um, stuff like CockroachDB or Yucabyte and all of those things. Yeah, they really yeah. start to, yeah. And then... But on the other hand, like the, the MongoDBs, for example, start to integrate ACID transactions and all of those things. So it's this like cycle of world changing, application changing, the, the workloads changing, and then new products coming in to, to adapt. And then the old databases eventually usually uh, catch up. And this is like super interesting times because now we have these vector databases yeah. popping up everywhere. And, you know, old school <laughs> database folks and actually i'm young school right i was a kernel programmer uh, initially but nonetheless so you know a lot of people are predicting that over time you know postgres will just you know take over and you have to actually if you look at what neon for example and superbase are doing they are bringing these capabilities through extension pg vector which existed for a, like a really long time uh, and just packaging in at, and 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 it's it's going to be super interesting to see how that fight uh, you know ends up with uh, you know from from but like that that's also a thing um, you you can't really it's super hard also to create new databases right so we 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 used to have this saying that you know if a database is less than five years old you shouldn't be using it right and there's some truth to it because like building a database from scratch. Is super hard but also like if you look at what what is happening recently everybody is just now building on top of existing databases right? nobody is creating databases from scratch anymore so same plus for us you know torso is sqlite if you look at what neon is doing or it's it's still postgres they're innovating in the storage layer uh planet scale mysql of course they have the the, the, the sharding stuff with vitesse and so forth but that's the that I believe is the is this the cycle of uh, database development. Great answer. Uh, and one thing which I specifically would like to highlight is I asked this to Yoran as well, the Tiger Beetle CEO, that you are writing a database from scratch, and database is something which is usually battle tested software. Mm -hmm. So, how do you uh, give your users that trust that this database is equivalent, for example, to the existing solution? Because the existing solutions are there for 20 years performing well you know things like that so i mean i get this answer correctly that if you build on top of that of on top of a database let's mm. say mysql and you try to improve that um, usually you won't have to you have you won't have that trust issue because uh, you can say mm -hmm. this is a improved mysql rather than mm -hmm. a ground up from scratch database so tiger beetle is actually super interesting uh, and i think so, so and I, it remains to be seen if this if this becomes a trend. But basically, the basic premise of of, of Tiger Beetle is that we're going to build a special purpose database uh, because it's an accounting mm -hmm. database essentially. But I don't know if they have plans to make it more general. But like we're going to make this database to solve this 
kind of specific problem and we're just going to make it insanely great. Uh, so they, they're doing a lot of interesting stuff around performance, right? But they wouldn't have a chance of, of, of convincing people unless they did what I think is like the super great thing, of, sort of the, the most interesting idea behind the Tiger Beetle, which is the deterministic simulation testing. Like they are yeah. essentially what, so like, it's like for Turso, one of the key things we claim is that, you know, it's just SQL, right? Because, you know, uh, under the hood it is, and it, it's, it's robust, uh, well-tested and well-understood and so forth. So what the Tiger Beetle folks are essentially trying to do, and I think probably successfully, is to say, hey, you know, sure, <laughs> you, you know, databases do need a lot of time uh, to mature, but we have this, you know, magic trick. I think Joran even calls it the magic trick, which is essentially, we're going to make it possible for you to run these massive randomized simulations, right? And that's not new, mm -hmm. right? We, we, when we work at SillaDB, we also had that. But the problem with randomized testing always has been that it's, you know, you trigger a bug, so what? You, you cannot, you know, it's super hard to reproduce. So the magic trick with this deterministic simulation is that, you know, as long as you know the seed of the random uh, number sequence, you can always go back and replay the exact same thing. Foundation DB did this, they are doing that as well. Uh, it's super interesting to see. And but it's also it's kind of insane if you look at the like the level of detail they had to do and the whole architecture is built around this idea. Uh, so I think mm. that's super interesting, yeah. Yeah. You mentioned about that as well in the podcast, just plugging my podcast here. Uh, but yeah. That was quite cool. Okay, so now uh, Terso DB. What is Terso DB? Why should we care about Terso DB? <laughs> yeah. So, to, so I, I, I spoiled it already. So, to SQL right? Right. So, what we try to do with Terso is is more or less bring SQL right to scenarios and applications that it you know it just doesn't. It, it, as itself, it doesn't uh, really work. Right? So yeah. if we take a step back, what is SQLite? It's a database library, right? So it is a full-blown relational database engine, which you put yeah. inside your application. Why do you want to do something like this? You basically are co-locating your application compute and the data, right? So if with the traditional database or classic database like Postgres MySQL, what those databases are giving you is essentially uh, remote SQL execution. So SQL is the you know, query language, and you know you want to like uh, you know s perform a query to select your top hundred listeners of the podcast or whatever, right? So with uh, MySQL or Postgres, what you do is you transport this query over the network to the database engine, and then they will have a query planner to figure out you know what's the best way to retrieve this and so forth. Uh, and that all gets prepared and, and optimized. And basically, what your application is constantly doing is doing these round trips, right? So, mm. you, know, give, get, get, you know, here's my query, give me the results, right? So this works for a lot of traditional applications, of course. But what has happened recently is you have what I mentioned, you know, I think in the beginning was uh, the, the serverless edge, right? So you have uh, this trend of having or moving compute closer to users. So Cloudflare workers is a great example. Uh, and what I tend to, like I, I, I did a presentation about, maybe it was the one that you, you were referring to, but basically like the difference for me, so I live in, you know, close by to Helsinki, which is the capital of, of Finland. Um, if, if I need to go, if my application is to access something at the AWS data center, the closest one is in a different country. So, so Sweden, uh, I think has the has the closest data center, but there is actually ten kilometers from my house. There is a point of presence, so some data center that Cloudflare is renting. So now you can imagine that there is quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of a uh, uh, you know latency difference. So now I have this compute super close to me, right? But if I need to get the data, then you know I always have to go through the round trip. Uh, to some mm -hmm. data center, right? So, like, what we're trying to do, and it doesn't work in all all development scenarios, but like, the thinking really is: can we just put SQLite there where the compute actually happens? And then, the problem with SQLite is because it is this embedded model 
like what do you do with basically rights that you would want to propagate in in other places so you know the first thing we added was replication uh, you know, we were not the first ones to do it. There's a project called LightFS, for example, that, mm -hmm. that also this does something similar. Uh, but basically, and then we built a server mode uh, because, you know, on Cloudflare Worker specifically, you can't have mm -hmm. any state there and, and so forth. So the reason you should care about Turso is that if you're building these, uh, you know, let's say modern <laughs> web applications, for example, you're taking advantage of the edge. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it, it basically allows you to have the database super close by. Understood. Um, okay, so I'll, I have a very, uh, very dumb question here. So please don't mind. There are no dumb questions. <laughs> <laughs> Why Terso? Why not a cache? That's a great question. That is not like so. That that's that's a great question. So. Uh, I, I tend to frame it as well. So there are different ways to cache, uh, of course. So the typical way um, that people uh, do edge data today is is using something like a key value store. Uh, so Redis, for example. So mm. the 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 benefit or the reason why we're you know trying to bring SQLite into the mix is because now you can actually do transactional queries at the at the at the edge right because the way you build so uh, i think a typical architecture is that you know you because now you have the compute uh, on the edge so for example cloudflare workers you need some data there so what you need to do is you know you have your important big database somewhere uh, you need to pre-process the data somehow you need to ship it to the the edge key value store uh, and then you somehow need to keep that cache consistent right and and when do you invalidate it is, is basically the yeah. big question but also more importantly i think is that now on the edge you know you can only access the data in the ways that you actually uh, already sort of pre-baked it right so you know when you bring sqlite over there you know you can now do the the queries you need you plus you can you know you basically can do transactional reads as well so one of the things that that we do is we bring the whole uh, right ahead log essentially to to the mm -hmm. edge node. So what it means is that you you're always because this is also a thing like people assume a lot of times that if you're using the edge, it has to be eventually consistent. Uh, mm. But but what we can do is so it, the, the replication part is still eventually consistent. But the reads mm -hmm. themselves, you either see the whole transaction. Or if you don't see the whole transaction, you're reading back in time, right? So I think that's a super powerful way uh, for applications to use it. And like we're not the you know, only ones to do this. The Foundation DB has this thinking of this mode where they basically do snapshot isolated reads, uh, you know. Uh, and, and Foundation DB was actually one of the things we looked into. It just it just doesn't really work that well if you have this edge locations uh, but, but nonetheless so that's the reason so basically have the data there and and not have to do the, the caching layer and all the pains that comes with with caching but by the way so there are other ways to do this as well so there is a company called uh, ready set which implemented uh, query caching and it actually comes oh. from academic work then noria is a like I could think they call it like partially materialized view or, or something like that. And planet mm -hmm. scale boost is basically just implementing that as well. Uh, but it's mm -hmm. still the model with that kind of thing is that you have to select the queries that you want to be cached. And then it gets like you can still you, you can do that query, uh, but it's mm -hmm. still basically coming from from the um, centralized server in this eventual consistent way. So we just think that this is a more flexible, uh, you know, a better model to, to do queries at the edge. Like basically having the ability to do what you would expect to be able to do in, in an application. That oh, makes sense. Uh, yeah, I'm just thinking how write will work, how so write is quite clear. If I want to write it, write to it, you are basically maintaining a wall, and then wall gets uh, conflict resolved eventually. So so we 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 cheat, right? You know the best, the simplest solutions are where we cheat. So and so what we always do is we force you to write. So we pick a server which is the primary, and then writes always mm. happen there, right? And mm. what this implies is that you know 
if you have a write heavy application, then you're bound by that um, single primary server, right? But the, mm -hmm. but what what you essentially do is that at the edge you read, and then if you need to write, you go to to a server, right? And mm -hmm. what we what we're basically saying also is that a lot of these data sets are small, and they mm -hmm. are basically sharded in some logical way. So one of the things we're in the middle of a launch week actually with Tursor right now. And on Monday we announced mm. per user databases. And that is essentially all about the the thinking mm. that you know you instead of having a database, you will have lots of databases in, in different mm. different places. But also and I have to also of course mention that there are super interesting projects going on at the moment which are more in the let's say local first or offline first movement where they yeah. basically allow you to do writes uh, and then you know through crdts or, or or different mechanisms basically resolve the conflicts we we don't support that at the moment uh you know it's a it's an obvious kind of yeah. thing that that fits what, what we're doing but the funny thing is that we found so multiplayer so applications where you do collaboration like you know figmas and, and those mm -hmm. kinds of things you absolutely do need it but for the types of applications that we see, uh, you know, the, the, I'm actually have been surprised <laughs> when we decided to do to go with this simple model. We assumed from the very beginning that this is not going to fly, right? But actually, you can get super far with it, at, at least you know, based on what we see. Uh, I am just thinking, or rather, brainstorming with you, that mm -hmm. I think uh, Terso DB with uh, WebAssembly will be a good use case. Um, like since you talked about Figma and all, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm just thinking out loud. Yeah, absolutely. So, 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 what is basically if you look at this? Uh, so, um, I forgot the names of the, the projects, and you know, just uh, you can Fermion. find them. Well, so Fermion is 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 a um, is a platform, right? That that supports yeah. WebAssembly. So a lot of this. So th there is a clear trend uh, with Edge and and WebAssembly for sure. But what these local first movement folks are essentially doing is putting SQLite all the way into the browser, right? And the way to do that is to yeah. compile it into WebAssembly. So I think there's a lot of definitely a lot of uh, interesting ground uh, there. And you know, like for us. I actually, you know, just thinking out loud, I like we're really maybe focused on more conservative approach where, you know, we just integrate with or try to integrate with the existing ecosystem and the application frameworks, all the object relation mappers and all of those things. Uh, but yeah, for sure, like, you know, once you like even with, with tools, like once you compile the query engine and all of this replication stuff into WebAssembly, then you have a lot of different options uh, you know where you deploy this thing, uh, and and yeah. and now you have the sort of flexibility in terms of how you write your application as well. Hmm. All right. Uh, just mentioning it here, listeners. If you are interested in WebAssembly, check out the previous episode. It was with Matt, who is CEO of Fermion. So mm -hmm. you will get to learn some cool stuff there as well. Yeah. All right. Absolutely. Now I want. <laughs> yeah. Now I want to ask uh, about. Uh, how do you, how would you ensure fault tolerance if you are an embedded database? Um, and won't there be stale data when somebody is query, is issuing a bigger query? So uh, let's tackle the stale data first. Sure. That that's by design, uh, yeah. because once you have so so. Uh, yeah, and I know you know. <laughs> no, probably it's fine. also yeah. all, 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 it was just just a realization. But like the thing is, once you so if you have a situation, it doesn't even have to be you know replicated globally. All you need is you know your that you know your access point and my access. So if you know if we if we now access the same serverless function running on Cloudflare, you know it will try to execute the stuff as close as possible to you and as close as possible to me. And this, you know, by definition will be different data centers. Uh, you know, I don't know where exactly you are, but I'm sure we are like 50 milliseconds apart anyway. I'm in uh, India, yeah. Yeah, 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 I know. But like, you know, it's yeah. a big country as well. Yeah, we, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, right. So, but, yeah. but nonetheless, so, so uh, basically, if we start to replicate in this scenario, 
uh, and if we yeah. try to use strong consistency so a model yeah. where you see exactly the same version as i do like writes yeah. are going to be impossibly slow right because yeah. now we have to basically so all, every write has to synchronize between the two of us right and i'm sure yeah. that there are ways to to try to try to make it faster but like that is essentially the distributed SQL model that already exists, right? And mm -hmm. what you see is that they typically, you know, you only have a couple of points of presences. Uh, um, you know, maybe you have a data center in the US and EU and, and, and you know, that's pretty much the cluster, the, the way to stretch the cluster. So like what we did uh, in very early on is like, we don't want this model, right? We, we, did, we want transactionality. Right, so we don't want eventual mm -hmm. consistency in in a sense mm -hmm. that you know you read what what like we we want you to be able to read consistently. But on the other hand, we don't want to pay this price for the right. So what we ended mm -hmm. up with is like as I mentioned before, a model which is snapshot isolated reads, and we think this is fine for most applications you can think of because mm -hmm. you are always reading a consistent view of the world. But it can be yeah. a bit behind, right? And essentially, that's going to be the replication lag. So it can be, you know, tens of milliseconds and hundreds of or hundreds of milliseconds. And this only really hurts you if there's a write heavy workload, like if the data keeps yeah. changing all the time. So so that's the stale stale data part. Uh, fault tolerance. We are not fault tolerant. So Turso is not fault tolerant. And just to be explicit, fault tolerant is supposed to survive, you know stay always on regardless if machines are dying, right? So that's not mm. what we are aiming for. Uh, we're aiming for high availability and high availability. Mm. I, and, and I try to use these terms as precisely as I, as I can. But, like, mm. but basically, high availability allows some downtime. And for us, mm. it's specifically around writes, right? Because if you have multiple replicas, you are always serving reads. As I mentioned, mm. the, the, the primary is the one that handles all the rights. If the primary dies, what happens is that you lose rights. But there's also thinking behind this, right? Because mm. as we mentioned or discussed already, if you want to do rights at the edge, right? So mm. what options do you have? Either you do something like what we do, you, know, you go always always into a single place. And we mm. could make the primary also fault tolerant and just use raft or whatever, or, you know, mm view stamp replication within a data center, right? We, we could definitely do yeah. that. But I don't think that is probably what people will do at the edge. Instead, I think these local first folks are right. Like you want to just write locally, right? And yeah. then, you know, propagate the change. And that basically also means like the trade-off I think is fast writes, but you know, sometimes you don't manage to to get your all updates right and and that's you know in the collaborative applications and so forth and really i think like when you need strong consistency you know you should yeah. just write to a you know cloud database or, or whatever like yeah. or like in, even in the case of tools so just write to this single location you know you lose yeah. speed but you gain this sort of durability in a, in a sense Th that's at least the way, way we're thinking about uh uh tools. no no it's fascinating i mean so essentially, if I understand Tursa correctly, um, you are specifically aiming for those use cases where the requirement is of extremely low latency and high availability. So in that perspective, I see it also being a great fit. So so and and just so I think that's the I think that's the edge and spreadless use case, right? So you could you could still use uh, uh, Tursa as a, as a quite traditional database, right? So what you could do is you use even spin up one machine. Like I said, we don't support fault tolerance right now. It's something yeah. for sure you, like actually we, I, we, we, we experimented with Raft and, and, and SQLite actually quite early on. Uh, and, yeah. and that's, you know, that's how we discovered, uh, you know, also through experimentation. Although, you know, if we've just been thinking a little bit, we would have been obvious, but nonetheless, so, you know, we, we and there's DQ light and, and all of those things already uh, existed. So we, you could use Turso as a really traditional database, but the question is, why would you want to do that? Like the, exactly. one of the things, one of the things I think with the edge that's probably going to happen is that like the cloud databases are not going away, right? You have, you mm -hmm. still have these centralized databases 
you know, filled with stuff. And you, you see this also when you talk to talk to folks, because like what you need at the edge is some subject subset of the data that was processed right. through a machine learning model or, or whatever, right? So and mm -hmm. this like that's really from my perspective the thinking is that you know you would have this massive let's say Postgres database at you know mm -hmm. AWS data center and then you process this data somehow and out pops these smaller data sets, per user data sets, which could be, you know, even hundreds of Ks or megabytes and so forth. You will have lots of them, right? But that's really the thinking, uh, thinking behind the, the, the model of tools. No, no, it's fascinating. Now I really understand what Turso is. So basically uh, you have made the classical embedded DB, which was usually used for, you know, POC or testing mm -hmm. as a real powerhouse and yes. made it uh, edge friendly. Quite cool. Yeah. So thank you, Pekka, for answering all these questions. <laughs> I am sure that you know I bugged you a lot and questions were from all the place. No, but it's so, I, so I so for for me like you know I usually uh, you know I tell people to, to to ask me to stop like because for example like I really love like the trying to connect the dots between you know the you know all of the stuff that I that I you know, worked on operating systems and databases and like you were also asking me about like in the beginning about abstractions and so forth like I think one of the key things at least for me is like I I don't want to stop thinking about things at some specific layer i know mm. many people and it you know it's, it keeps you sane as well but i really love this like this transition of of, of, of what you did with your questions it was super great thank thanks a lot so before we go uh i want to ask you i ask this to all the guests here mm -hmm. that you have to give me an advice uh mm -hmm. which not me i mean in uh, to the young listeners who are into first year second year of experience, corporate experience, or who are just passing out college, that mm -hmm. is graduation. What would you tell them? How do they become, uh, you know, uh, in five or 10 years, Pekka, and they start their own tour? So? <laughs> uh, that's a super hard question. So like, I think the honest answer is that, there, you know, you need you need luck like like luck has to be involved like like i mentioned in my case like it wasn't a case where i decided like, this is what i'm gonna do uh, now it was like we we got you know opportunity arrives arrives but like what i i, I guess what i would uh, recommend people is you know just just try to dig into some things that you know fascinate you and one when you dig in just dig in real you know really deep like for example what I was, uh, and you know, I, I well, I'm a, this is a ter this is terrible advice. I never had like a really good plan to do anything. Like for me, it was when I discovered Linux and and the way that you can actually uh, you could read the code and participate in the mailing list. So I, I like I really literally spent all the evenings <laughs> just digging through the code and and just spending the time to understand things which I totally didn't understand. And that like because I think that is important to really you know, dig into the stuff that you're working with and, and really sort of not being satisfied with, okay, you know, just sort of this superficial way of, of you know, this is how it works. Like, just dig into it. Like, why does it work this way? And so forth. And, you know, you probably, you know, I, I don't know where you end up in, but but that, that I, I, but I'm sure that you will have a lot of fun time and it will really develop your way of, of thinking and building systems. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Becca. Uh, Thank you. I hope to have you again soon. Thank you.